for way too long. Co-host of the Annie and Elston Show, weekdays from 10 to 2 on our sister station, 97.3, the fan in San Diego. We all love San Diego. Got to get down there for a Padres Giants game. Padres Hot Tub Podcast and talks all things Padres. Craig, good morning, man. How you doing? Thanks for joining us here on The Morning Roast. Uh, it's my pleasure, gentlemen. I appreciate the invite. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So I've been trying to figure out um, what the heck went wrong with Bob Melvin down there in San Diego because obviously he's the Giants' new manager. And, you know, with Shasky and I are hey, we're trying to warm up to the hire. We know him from his A's days. He's, he was there for nearly a decade. But with all that talent in San Diego a season ago, coming off an of NLCS appearance a season prior to that, it's just, it, we're befuddled on how it didn't work out. What went wrong? Did he connect with the clubhouse? What happened? How did he, what was the end of Bob Melvin down there with San Diego, man? What were your thoughts at this time with the Padres? Well, it, it's a it's a great question, and it's one that probably is like an onion, right? Like, I mean, you can just peel off layers on this. So I would start with on the field because the 2023 Padres were a unique configuration and one that we'll rarely see again a team that was put together at exorbitant cost by an owner who was trying to win as his dying wish and uh you know had this incredible collection of of you know multi-million dollar talent at the top of the lineup people compare you know it's the Beatles of baseball and all of this but I will tell you gentlemen that the 2023 Padres were never connected as a team there was a disconnect on that team throughout the season until like the final couple weeks of the season. And that to me is something that speaks to a manager setting a culture and setting a tone or not setting a culture and setting a tone. There was a lot of, Hey, we've got the great players, roll them out there, see what will happen. Um, there was a lot of tinkering. There was, there was a lot of blown leads uh, in the seventh and eighth inning and on the field, it didn't work. Meanwhile, off the field, there was a growing rift between A.J. Preller and Bob Melvin, and it got worse. And I'm sure at some point in your guys' professional lives, you've had the unfortunate pleasure of working with a higher-up or, or working with a, someone below you that you just didn't get along, and it just didn't click, and, and the styles aren't the same. And that can be something that hardens you as a year goes on and, and kind of maybe takes away from some of your creativity as things go on. So... It just didn't fit here. Uh, I think Bob is a San Francisco kind of guy, you know, and I'm sure it's going to work with the Giants along the way. Uh, but down here, unfortunately, you know, and I, I defended him. I got to say, I defended him so hard last year. I was really upset and definitely took his side on the Bob versus AJ stuff. Um, seeing a new manager managing mostly the same group of players has kind of changed my opinion somewhat. Um, and I just wonder if it was ever going to be a fit here. Yeah, I just look at this roster after seeing them in, in you know the opening series. It's just loaded. Like Cronenworth, Bogarts, who was a shortstop, now he's playing second base. You know, Kim, Machado, DH, Fernando Tatis Jr. I mean, th this team is a 20 year old who was starting in center field on opening day. This team is absolutely loaded. And and I, I guess to Bonte's point, like, are, do they just not like each other? Does Machado just right. not like Tatis? Like, what is it? Because they're oozing with talent. Right. I, I don't think it's. I don't think there's anything to that. I know there there was you know a famous clip in 2021 when the team was in the middle of a complete death spiral. And my gosh, I would hope that some people would be mad at each other uh, at a time like that. No, Tatis and Machado get along fine. Uh, you know it. I don't know if you guys saw the athletic story on, on Soto a couple of days ago by Richard Rowley. It was really, it was really good. I think it was really balanced, not right. casting aspersions on Juan Soto in any way. But when I speak about a disconnection, I think he's kind of your, your poster boy for that last year in terms of a guy who just didn't there, – it, there wasn't a complete team click that, that was going on. There was a lot of who bats second. I don't want to bat second. I don't want to bat third. I only want to bat third. You know, like all of that huh. kind of stuff was happening last year. And I'm, I'm here to tell you guys it's a lot different this season. Right. Mike Schilt ha has installed a completely different type of clubhouse culture, and that culture stems from the leaders as well, from Manny Machado, from Joe Musgrove, from Fernando, who are all on the same page of, of, of reflecting on the disappointment of what happened last year and vowing to, to make it better. I mean, obviously there was a lot of talent that went out the door, 
uh, at the end of, of 2023, you don't just replace Juan Soto. <laughs> it's impossible. Right. Um, he's one of the five best players in the league. But uh, this team is far more connected than last year's team really ever was, and it's, it's refreshing. Craig Elston here on the Morning Ross on 95.7 The Game, co-host of the Annie and Elston weekdays from 10 to 2 on our sister station, 97.3 The Fan in San Diego. Before that first answer you gave us, you said at the end there that your opinion changed with this new manager, Mike Shield, who came over from St. Louis. So your opinion changed on Bob Melvin, on what he was doing in that clubhouse and the way that clubhouse atmosphere kind of played out last season. Where did your opinion change? I want to clarify that. Uh, excellent follow-up, Monte. And uh, I think it's because when you see someone – actively and listen perceptions always change right right we're nine games into the season so this is my nine games into the season right right, right. <laughs> just, want make, nope. just want to make that clear no doubt no put doubt that little, put that little flag on top of this okay fair um when you see someone who is actively creating something positive uh it stands out in comparison to just a maintenance of things and, and that's what I would describe as what was going on last year, was there was a lot of, we're not sure which way we should go. Uh, maybe Machado should take the lead, but maybe it's Bogart's team. He's a brand new player here, but he's a great leader. Maybe he should be the lead. There was a lot of that, and I don't feel like Bob asserted himself within the middle of that. I, I think he felt like I'm a, you know, I've got my own fish to fry, and these guys are big boys, and they'll figure it out, and it didn't work. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the year before, he was very careful in, in the first time that he really aired out the team and fired, a, fired that bullet. You know, as a manager, you probably have one of those a year. Um, he fired it in August of 2022, and the team rallied and made the playoffs. Last year, he fired it in the second week of May. <laughs> Dang. Situation <laughs> and, critical. <laughs> yeah. and, and, like, they immediately responded by losing the next two games and you know, going to San Francisco and getting swept. And, and, and really, it just – his – messaging didn't click in any sort of proactive fashion. There were some reactive things that happened. And then there was a rift between himself and the front office. There's no rift. Mike Schultz been in the Padres organization for two years. He, he and, and AJ Preller have a very good relationship and one that's had two years, which is often the knock, right? That you can work with him for a year, but after a couple of years, he becomes hard to work for. Uh, Mike's already in the middle of that. And, it's just a much different feeling around the team. I don't think this team's as talented as last year's team. The expectations are far lower, but uh, I think he's got them more together. I, I want to go around the diamond on the Padres before we ask you about like how you guys in San Diego are viewing the Giants situation. Because I I'm gonna I'm gonna be a hundred percent honest. Like I I watched you guys in the division for many many years choke away big leads, and, and now when you have this roster, I'm like wow, good for the Padres. Like good for the fans. Cronenworth is stud at first. Bogarts going from short to second base is kind of head scratching to me because you gave him a ten year deal, but Kim is clearly a better defensive shortstop than him. Machado already DH. You know, Tatis not playing shortstop, moving out to right field. Like, there's a lot going on here. But then you got these young guys, that the, the, the third baseman, Jackson Merrill in center field. This is an unbelievable amount of talent. And I'm just curious as to how they're piecing this thing together. Because I was surprised to see Manny Machado not playing third base defensively. Well, let, let me let me fill you in right there. Manny Machado had, uh, like, the worst version of tennis elbow. Uh, it completely limited him last season. In the in the final six weeks of the season, he could pretty much only DH and play two out of three days, mm -hmm. and he had surgery. He had surgery in the off season to address it. So that surgery gave him a timetable to get back to playing full time of what stacks up to probably around May gotcha. of this year. Mm -hmm. So he's been throwing. He has been doing all. He's been doing all the infield drills at third base, and he will be back at third base. It's just a matter of him building up his throwing progression and getting to the point where he knows that he can do that every day and it's not going to be dealing with any kind of pain uh, or, you know, or any, any sort of uh, you know, overarching issues. So expect to see Manny Machado back at third base sooner than later, which will then leave the Padres with no DH. <laughs> but, 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 Sounds like but the Giants from the last five years, Craig. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, exactly. Like literally no DH, um, which is why I've been campaigning on the daily down here for them to sign Brandon Belt. 
Uh, and I think he would just be an absolutely perfect fit oh. uh, for oh. the Padres. Oh, our producer just, just jumped up out of his seat I and just he up. just went crazy. I think he may buy, buy a Brandon Belt Padre jersey now after you just mentioned that, Craig Elson. He'll be good for roast. 72 games. Yeah, yeah but, you know, I, I'll let you deal with those Sign problems, Sign him with Craig. 70 to go. I'll, do, I'll let you deal with those problems. But how do you look at the Giants? You saw the Giants in that opening series at Petco Park, a very competitive series. Uh, obviously, it was a split. Padres really put it on Dalton Jeffries yeah. in that Sunday game. It's Score nine runs in the first two innings, but how do you guys view the Giants here? Are they a threat to contend? Uh, obviously, the Dodgers are by far and away the best team in the They're division. I don't think anybody's yeah. catching up. But for second place, I feel like this battle for second place in the West will be intriguing between the Padres, D-backs, and for and, and the Giants here. So, how do you guys deal? How do you guys view the Giants uh, from down there in San Diego? Okay, so start with just looking basically at San Francisco. Um, hundred percent, it's an improved team. I think Lee so far has been. Uh, at the top end of the range of what you might have expected, uh, you know, and, and performing in April, that's extremely, extremely impressive. Um, Solaire is an obvious addition. I don't think he's going to hit 30 homers uh, playing in your park, uh, but he's, he's, you know, on base, power threat, Chapman, defense, you know, we'll see what that bat gives you. You know, uh, obviously he's got his history of being, you know, uh, subject to long stretches of slumps, uh, but he's a good, good, steady third baseman every day. I think, you know, you guys should catch the ball a little bit better. And it's going to come down to what the upside is on these left-handers, I think, in your rotation. Because I was very impressed with Harrison first time out. Young pitcher. He's going to have his, you know, navigation. And Blake, you know, I mean, Blake is one of my favorite players in baseball. He's the guy that I got the jersey to sit in the stands and watch. Wow. the last three years, wow. and and to be honest, probably around June of last year, I remember saying on my podcast that I was kind of looking forward to watching him pitch for his next team um, because he can be a very frustrating pitcher to watch, like a very frustrating pitcher to watch. 65 pitches in two outs in the third inning, and you're going, what the hell are we doing here? <laughs> He's never going to make it to five. Um, that's going to happen. Full counts are going to happen. Uh, uh, you know, back-to-back walks to start the inning. Um, you know, those types of things are part of Blake Snell's arsenal. But when he clicks, as he obviously did last year, he then went the whole summer and like allowed six more runs. Um, you know, and, and when he does that, it means he's throwing six shutout innings yeah. for your team. He, he, is, he is a very specific, narrow band, uh, you know, type of success. It's, it's five or six innings, six at the tops. And, and if you're hoping for six dominant shutout innings. From Blake Snell. I really enjoy him. Uh, he is a fickle bird. And the open question for you guys is going to be how he adjusts to all of this. Because he got off the bad starts every single year. Interesting. And, and in May, people were calling for him to be demoted like every year. Yeah, wow. like, you know, dumb call, like dumb callers. You know what I mean? But still, like, <laughs> you know, get, get, this, get this guy out of the rotation. <laughs> you know, like every, every year, like six to eight starts, he's not good. Sounds like uh, our show. You know, yeah. No, we don't have dub callers, Craig. Yeah. Hey, Craig, let me ask you yeah. this one. You sound like you've been down there a long time, and we're just sports fans in general. So we've had our eye on San Diego. I've been down to that ballpark numerous times. I love it down there. The rebrand for the Padres with the uniforms is one of the best rebrands in sports. Yeah. You've lost the Chargers, obviously. I don't know how the demographics break down in terms of if people are still rooting for them or not. But how fun is it to be a Padre fan right now, given that the team is really talented and they've got unbelievable star appeal? Like, it's got to be the, the top dog uh, for you guys in a long, long time at, to, to, to root for this team. The Padres were very, very smart in the way that they attacked the vacancy of the Chargers in San Diego and ramped up their team and got expensive and competitive. Uh, at the right time. They've always done the right thing in terms of having an incredible ballpark experience, uh, enhancing that experience year over year, making Petco Park just uh, such a great place to go to where it is ensconced within downtown. It's, it's really perfect in so many ways. So that has kind of been a slow build. And then the last four years have been the payoff. You see how much San Diego reaches back and loves back the Padres when they are trying hard <laughs> to win and, and, you know, trying to put a competitive product in the field. Over 3 million fans set the record last year. They've already sold out their season tickets this year. They're expecting to have a very similar 
attendance, and you know they're going to have to play well to make sure that that happens. Um, you know, we're I, I look at it just to kind of finish Bonte's uh, first question. I look at the National League as the Dodgers and the Braves have two spots. The Central automatically gets a spot, and the Phillies are going to get the fourth spot. Yeah. Totally agree. So yep. So there, there's two playoff spots for about seven teams mm-hmm. who could very well finish within about three games of one another at the end of the year. I think this season is going to be decided for all of us, for you guys, for us, on the margins. How many times did you lose to Colorado? How many times did you beat L.A.? <laughs> yep. You know, what was, yep. what, what was your record against uh, 500, you know, below 500 teams? Mm-hmm. Like, these are going to be the things that decide it because I really think that we're just going to trade blows all year long. And, you know, it was a split last weekend. Maybe someone's going to take two out of three this weekend. But I think it's going to be pretty unlikely for any of our three competing teams, Arizona, us, and you, to finish better than eight and five Craig. against each other. Like, it's, it's going to be close. Craig, thank God for Colorado, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. Maybe you can snatch up Chris, Chris Bryant as your DH. Man, he looks miserable oh, in Colorado he looks so right sad. now. <laughs> He's like lost Hello, into darkness, the abyss. My old friend. Oh my gosh, Craig! Real, real quick, you, you talk about that San Diego market. You brought up the void that the Chargers left. I don't, I don't know anything about the San Diego politics or anything about that. I know it's tough to get a stadium. I down know there. La Jolla San, is beautiful. The, I do love La Jolla. It's beautiful. San Diego State just got a new stadium yes. there, which fits their campus, and I think that's a big deal for the Aztecs. Any rumblings about an NFL team coming to San Diego from just the local government down there in that six one nine? None at all, none whatsoever. Wow. Not going to happen. Probably never going to happen. Wow. Um, straight up, like it, because also, why would the teams in LA support that? Yeah, um, that's a good they, point. They, they they've fought to turn San Diego into what it is uh, within their their hierarchy. I'll tell you guys what this is now. It's a soccer city. All right. Oh wow. San Diego. San Diego Wave FC has set every attendance record for the National Women's Soccer League wow. at over 32,000 at their home opener. Holy smokes. Won the shield in their second season. Uh, average over 20,000 fans a game at yep. the new football stadium, Snapdragon Stadium. Yep. Uh, at MLS is coming to San Diego next season. San Diego FC uh, will begin playing next season. Uh, international soccer matches are coming here all the time. Uh, soccer has really filled a void. Uh, in San Diego, it's been beautiful to see. There's plenty of other niche teams. I work for the San Diego Soccer. It's an indoor team that's been here forever uh, and has won 16 titles. We've got professional lacrosse. We've got professional hockey, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But soccer is where the second big leagues are here for our, for our city. And, and quite honestly, the NFL, we don't have the right stadium. We're not right-sized yeah. for the NFL. And, and ain't nobody building it with public money down here. Nah. Ain't going to happen. No way. Nah, especially in the state of California. I was just, I ran in down a rabbit hole a few weeks ago. They had a Super Bowl down in San Diego, the Raiders and the Bucks. Because they had a few Super Bowls down there at Jack Murphy Stadium. Broncos, Packers. Of course, Doug yep. Williams loved the Broncos down there in San Diego. The old Murphy yep. was a great Super Bowl town because you knew the weather was always going to be good. So a little sad that San Diego doesn't have that pro team. But San Diego Aztecs, San Diego State Aztecs as well, got a great program down there. So it's just, it's like, Craig, man, we're going to do this again. <laughs> great knowledge there. Uh, Padres are trying to be battling all season long. You'll be our Padres unofficial, official insider here in the morning, Rose. Appreciate it so much. Uh, I've watched you a lot on, on Warriors up, you know, as, as I check in because uh, I'm a huge NBA fan, even though we don't have a team down right. here. Um, and I uh, appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah, anytime you want, just give me a ring. Anytime, Craig. Anytime. Good stuff, man. Thanks Thanks so much for the time, man. Craig Elston, co-host Andy and Elston Weekdays, 10 to 2 or-